It's not hard to get up in the morning and go to your studio all day long. What's hard is to get up in the morning and push yourself beyond your own shadows and beyond your own what you were taught to do and taught to think and taught to say. And like I was raised a certain way and you had to leave home in a really deep way and wander. You know, if I had a motto about pain, it'd be like, stay scared. I do portraits because, you know, <laughs> the easy answer is because portraits are there, because I'm here, but the hard answer for doing a portrait is because I'm on a, on a search for where I live, kind of, and it's always changing. This self-portrait is a really tight, small one, and I really like it. It's just, it's just based, sometimes I just do ideas that aren't revelations. So this isn't a rema. This is an idea like, it's called self-portrait sitting, and I don't like, so I sort of give myself scholastic things, pretty tight ones. Not crooked. Not crooked. It's it's so weird because the internal painting's crooked. So like my whole thing is like if you have the shoulder off by an inch, by the time you get to the elbow, it's off three inches, and by the time you get up to the wrist, it's like ten inches. You know what I mean? You so. know how torsos have like contrapposto. It's called like the Greek um, torsos. They have like a twist, and it's a counterweight. That's what contrapposto is, and when I did whole bodies, I could always put that in. And so then the problem I had is I really wanted to do a, just the face, but I wanted that twist, that torque to it. The, the backgrounds are different there and there, and that change in where it is in space twists it more too. having the light drip off the red like that and have the face drip off a little too shows that you know sort of light can change everything you know or nothing you have your eye and you have your hand when you work and a lot of people have all these shadows between their hand and their eye and they're like education and theories and all that stuff and my job is to have my hand and my eye be direct and the, to take all that bogus stuff out from between. And that would be art history, uh, you know, stories about why, what a painting should look like, what this should look like. Like when you're in grammar school, they, you know, my teacher who I was in love with, Miss Carol, would be like, all trees are brown trunks and green leaves. And then the next year, there was like some cutbacks and then the teacher announced, all trees will now be black trunks and green trees. like. Okay, and then you just draw all your trees the same way, you know. And then when you look out when you're older, you realize a lot of trees are like gray and some are reddish and, you know, like, and it's like seeing them for the first time. And so you're told what's like American culture, you're told what's pretty, what's ugly, you know, you're told how to look and it's really fun to strip those things away. When I was eight, our family went to Denmark to so my father could study with Niels Bohr and, um, and I got a polio vaccine, and, and they think it was autoimmune to that, but it's unclear what it was and got rheumatoid arthritis, and so I lost my right eye and spent a really long time in the hospital. And just not being able to move and not being able to see kind of made you value when I could see again looking so much that it always seemed like, you know, just like the opening in the field, the place that you would most go to be happy. And, I started to lose my sight in the other eye and finally did. And so this is just a self-portrait I painted when I was totally blind. And, and you can see how scared it is. And it amazes me. Like, I'm always amazed by painting that ideas can come through. I would say I have really fancy surgery and get it all back, which is really amazing to me. It was just like, there's no other word except revelation. I mean, you know, we're like an enunciation, so it kind of really 
changed me even more towards just doing exactly what I want. When I couldn't see at all, it became really clear that all I ever want to do is paint, and that's really a problem when you're blind how to paint. Yeah, you know, especially since you only paint things you look at, you know. It was pretty recent, four to five years ago, yeah. And it was really amazing, because I really didn't, if I was going to be blind, I really didn't want to live, but I have children, so that's not, and I, you know, <laughs> that's not your option, you know what I mean? But Because that's how I, that's how I live, you know what I mean? So it didn't make any sense to me at all. And it was beyond, like, it wasn't like I was depressed, it was like I was terrified, you know what I mean? Called, um, I called it in the land of the blind, the whole show that I had of it. But this is like called ground fog, and it's there, and the blindness is blowing in, you know. And and you can see it, like the cataracts are starting to form, and and just the things are coming out of the fog, you know. These stretchers, the size they are, are basically arm size, so you could kind of feel your way across. So a lot of the um, um, marks are just made with my fingers. And then, hey. That one's a beautiful painting in a way, because it's the way things break apart and fall and shatter when you can't really see them clearly, like you're straining to see things but you can't so it's like glass is breaking kind of and then this is kind of a victory piece because it's it's called um green hole or black i think i called it black hole but i forgot that it's green <laughs> this part here is the arm my arm like that just sort of painting it as it recedes and here's like some fingers here mixed in with the trees and everything's pretty clear. It's just going away, and I can see the park again. The blindness is leaving, so I'm going out. It's receding, but in a way, I'm receding from that reality and coming back home. And so putting my arm there is like I'm back on the windowsill and present again. So when I get in the studio and shut the door, um, I don't feel like a woman painter at all. I just feel like a painter, you know? And I don't feel like a Jewish painter. I feel like a painter, and I don't feel like a one-eyed painter. I just feel like a painter. In fact, I don't even feel like a person. It's so neat, I just feel like what I look at is the only thing here, you know? Like I disappear. I suppose that's why other people take drugs or drink or something. I'm just gone to myself and so. My work's not that accessible or, you know, even fun to look at. And to have so many people be supportive or kind to me is kind of remarkable. And I think Rhode Island's really remarkable that way. The spiritual part of waiting, like, they also serve for stand and wait, you know. The, like, I come from lots of rabbis, and I never really thought I'd join back up with them again, but, I mean, reform rabbis, but still rabbis. <laughs> and I think the patience of it and, and the humbleness, really literally of waiting for answers, it is a really moving religious experience that isn't available to most people. You know, I'm kind of very attracted to altarpieces, too, because I'm hoping that my paintings are just a place where you can go rest, you know. And there's a lot of space and nothingness, you know, too. And I'm sort of hoping to nudge people into kind of nothingness, too.